Now, I'm not one to gossip, but I will bring you the tea. Welcome to Chronicles Speaks. Please, please, I don't have any time for any gossip now. Hey. Eh? Wendy, I don't know who is playing with your name, sis, but whoever it is, is coming after you with a vengeance. It seems like each time this lady gets well on her feet, something or someone seems to knock her back down. This time it's in a form of a bank. What bank? Wells Fargo. According to Wendy, they froze her assets. Because of all of this money being tied up and frozen, Sis says she can't pay her mortgages, she can't pay Kelvin his alimony, she can't even pay her employees. Not that she doesn't have it, but the bank is holding on to the money because they don't feel like Sis is competent enough to handle her own funds. Now y'all done got me pissed off. You do not mess with a black woman and her money. Anyway, before we get into that, be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss out on any of this tea. Now let's get back into it. First and foremost, I do have to shout out YouTube's very own Choke No Joke, who had this information before anybody, before it was even on the court website. So y'all make sure y'all check him out, Choke No Joke. Now let's get into it. Now there was a document filed in New York Superior Court yesterday with Wendy Hunter. Y'all know that is the name she legally goes by since Mary and Kelvin, but Wendy Hunter versus Wells Fargo Clearing Services LLC doing business as Wells Fargo Advisors. Now according to this lawsuit, Wendy has been trying to gain access to her funds with Wells Fargo. These said funds are well into the millions and not only are they not allowing Wendy to access the funds, but neither can her agents, i.e. the people who have the power of attorney to handle Wendy's personal business. Now I'm going to read this document in its entirety, but for the people who want the cliff notes, you want to hear it, here it goes. In April of 2018, Wendy entered into an asset advisor agreement with Wells Fargo. This agreement was to provide brokerage cash services and to make trades with Wendy's accounts. Now the money held in these accounts again is well into the millions. For two weeks or more, Wendy was unable to touch the funds. Not only could Wendy not touch the funds, she couldn't even send somebody else to the bank to touch the funds. Not only was that not allowed, but Wendy could not even view her account online. They shut her out of everything. Now she had a financial advisor with the bank whose name was Lori Schiller. Now, Wendy later on fired this advisor due to malfeasance as it relates to Wendy's accounts and the improper conduct that was handled with Wendy's accounts. Now, after Miss Lori was fired as Wendy's advisor, Miss Lori is still advising her company, Wells Fargo, as it relates to Wendy's account, saying that Wendy is not of sound mind to handle her own money. Because of that, Wendy is now going to be in trouble with her own bills, not being able to pay her mortgages, things that she has to pay for her family, credit cards, money to her ex-husband. Child, they didn't just got it all messed up. So not only does Wendy want this money issue cleared, but Wendy wants her money out of that bank. And not only does she want that, but Wendy wants y'all to pay her for this pain and suffering that you putting her through that she even has to go through and beg for her own money that she done worked hard for. Damn it, Kevin was a thorn in my side just as much as he was in Wendy's, but it seemed like everything just flowed a lot better when he was around. I'm about tired of this mess. All right, so that's the end of the cliff notes. Time to read the document. Petitioner Wendy Hunter by and through her attorney, Miami Entertainment Law Group, by way of petition against respondents, Wells Fargo Clearing Services, LLC, doing business as Wells Fargo Advisors, brings this special proceeding pursuant to Article 4 of the Civil Practice Law and Rules for an order pursuant to Article 63 of the CPLR and CPLR 7502C, preliminary in joining and restraining respondent and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing all of petitioner's accounts, including but not limited to personal, business, deferred compensation, and investment accounts and interfering with her rights to access her financial assets and statements pending a final binding decision by an arbitrator and alleges as follows. Now for the parties. Petitioner Wendy Hunter is an individual residing in New York, New York. 
Number two, upon information and belief, respondent is a foreign limited liability company operating and existing under the laws of the state of New York. Jurisdiction and venue. This court has jurisdiction pursuant to NY CPLR 302A because at all times material hereto, respondent has continuously engaged in, operated, and conducted their business within New York State. Venue is proper in this county pursuant to New York CPLR 506 because respondents determination to freeze petitioner's accounts and to interfere with her financial assets along with other material events took place within the judicial district in which New York County exists. Venue is also proper in this county pursuant to New York CPLR 7502 AI because at least one of the parties resides in or is doing business within New York County. All right, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Facts common to all causes of action. On or about April 11, 2018, petitioner and respondent entered into an asset advisor agreement and a client agreement. This is collectively known as the agreement. Upon information and belief, the purpose of this agreement is for Wells Fargo to provide brokerage cash services and to execute securities trades with petitioner's accounts. Upon information and belief, respondent is in possession of several million dollars worth of funds which belong to petitioner and are currently managed by Wells Fargo and are held in Wells Fargo possession. Now y'all listen to this part. For more than two weeks, respondent has denied petitioner any access, whether online or otherwise, to her financial accounts, assets, and statements based on the advisement by petitioner's former financial advisor, Lori Schiller, that petitioner was of unsound mind. Despite petitioner's termination of Schiller as her financial advisor due to Schiller's malfeasance in relations to petitioner's accounts and Schiller's improper conduct in relations to the professional relationship, respondent Wells Fargo continues to rely on Schiller's advisement as support for its decision to deny petitioner's access to her financial assets and statements. As additional support for its decision to keep petitioner's accounts frozen, respondent references its authority under the agreement to pause or reject instructions for a proposed transaction pending judicial or administrative remedies should they suspect financial exploitation, dementia, or undue influence. However, there is a God. However, the provision is inapplicable in this instance for several reasons, including the fact that petitioner, Wendy, has not proposed a transaction for which respondent, Wells Fargo, allegedly has the discretion to pause or reject. This is where the attorney added a little stank on it. And even if the provision did apply, respondent is going beyond the scope of the authority granted by the provision because respondent is completely denying petitioner the ability to access or even view, whether online or otherwise, her financial assets and statements, which petitioner has requested for the purpose of ascertaining the current standing of her account and which is not a transaction as contemplated under the agreement. Get it right, y'all. In other words, Wells Fargo actions and the actions of its agents have impeded and unlawfully prevented petitioner's access to her property. Although pre-dispute arbitration is required under the agreement, given the imminent and irreparable harm caused to the petitioner by the respondent's actions, petitioner seeks injunctive relief from this court pursuant to Article 63 of the CPLR and CPLR 7502C, preliminary enjoining and restraining the respondent from denying petitioner access to her financial accounts, assets, and statements pending a final binding decision by an arbitrator. Request for relief legal standard. Petitioner repeats and restates the allegations contained in the prior paragraph of this petition as if set forth more fully herein. Petitioner requests immediate preliminary injunction and temporary restraining orders, preliminary enjoining and restraining respondent and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing all of petitioner's accounts, including but not limited to personal, business, 
deferred compensation and investments accounts and interfering with her right to access her financial assets and statements. While ordinarily the function of preliminary injunction is to preserve the status quo until a final determination upon the merits can be made, there is no question that in a proper case, the Supreme Court has power as a court of equity to grant a temporary injunction which mandates specific conduct. All right, not going to read all of those court cases, but y'all do get the gist. To obtain a preliminary injunction, a petitioner must demonstrate a likelihood of success on the merits, irreparable harm in the absence of the injunctive relief, and a balancing of the equities in the petitioner's favor. The decision to grant or deny a preliminary injunction rests in the sound discretion of the court. To establish the likelihood of success on the merits, all that is required is a prima facie showing of the rights to the relief requested. Moreover, it is well settled that a likelihood of success on the merits may be sufficiently established where the facts are in dispute and the evidence is inconclusive. The Supreme Court may render a declaratory judgment having the effect of a final judgment as to the rights and other legal relations of the parties to the justifiable controversy whether or not further relief is or could be claimed. To state a cause of action for declaratory relief, a petitioner must show that there is a bona fide justifiable controversy between parties and adverse legal interests and a judgment would clarify or settle legal issues and finalize the controversy and offer relief for uncertainty. The petitioner must establish that the dispute is real, definite, substantial, and sufficiently matured so as to be ripe for judicial determination and that the declaratory judgment will have a direct and immediate effect upon the rights of the parties. In this case, petitioner is likely to succeed in establishing her right to a declaratory judgment because there is a bona fide controversy between petitioner and respondent as to petitioner's right to access her financial assets and respondent's decision to deny her such access. Due to the adverse legal interest between petitioner and respondent regarding this matter, a judgment would settle the legal issues and finalize the controversy. Additionally, given the imminent and irreparable financial damage directly resulting from respondent's actions, the declaratory judgment would have a direct and immediate effect upon petitioner's right to access her property. Thus, petitioner is likely to succeed on the merits for the declaration judgment against respondent. Breach of fiduciary duty, the elements of cause of action to recover damages from breach of judiciary duties are the existence of fiduciary relationship, misconduct by the defendant, and damages directly caused by the defendant's misconduct. In this case, petitioner is likely to succeed on the merits of a breach of fiduciary duty claim against respondent because petitioner will allege that the parties in fact have a fiduciary relationship. Respondent's misconduct in breach of its fiduciary duties include, but it's not limited to, respondent's unlawful determination to freeze, withhold, or otherwise alter petitioner's access to her financial assets, directly resulting in financial damages from petitioner's inability to make time bill payments and incurring fees as a result. Accordingly, because respondent engaged in conduct that was not in the best interest of petitioner, it breached its fiduciary duty. Thus, petitioner is likely to succeed on the merits of a breach of fiduciary duty claim. Petitioner further submits that potential harm faced by petitioner if respondent is permitted to continue to interfere with her ability to access her financial assets far outweighs any potential harm to respondent in being precluded from such actions during the pendency of an arbitration. If this court does not enjoin the respondent, petitioner will be in default of several bill payments, including her mortgages, her marital settlement payments, and employee payroll. Thus, respondent's actions, if not enjoined by this court, will threaten petitioner's financial viability. Respondent's continued interference with petitioner's ability to access her assets will not only result in petitioner's inability to support herself and her family, but also result in irreparable damage to her business and brand. By contrast, respondent will not suffer any actual harm if it is prohibited from withholding and interfering with the petitioner's financial assets and statements under these circumstances where the equities overwhelmingly favor petitioners preliminary injunctive relief is necessary and appropriate if the court does not grant the requested relief petitioner will continue to suffer imminent and irreparable harm because respondent is impeding petitioner's right to properly manage her personal finances and to make timely payments on billing accounts which threaten petitioner's financial viability and financial health and safety of her family. 
Additionally, without the court's intervention, respondent will be free to further damage petitioner and continue to interfere with petitioner's financial assets and property, which will threaten petitioner's ability to manage her ongoing business obligations. One factor in determining whether a harm is irreparable is the availability of a legal damage remedy that will adequately compensate the applicant. But the legal remedy must be as complete, practicable, and efficient as an equitable one. Moreover, the remedy at law is inadequate when the damages are not capable of measurement or difficult to determine or there would be a long delay in its availability. In this case, enjoining respondent from freezing, withholding, or otherwise altering any and all petitioner's financial accounts, assets, and property would be the most complete, efficient, and practicable way of maintaining petitioner's rights. The alternative would be to permit respondent to continue to deny petitioner's access to her financial assets and allow petitioner to default on her financial obligations, resulting in petitioner's inability to pursue ongoing business endeavors and to Force the arbitrator to attempt to measure petitioner's damage based on the amount of business the petitioner could have secured and the number of billing payments the petitioner could have kept current had she been permitted to access her assets. Thus, a legal action for damages is impracticable and inefficient when compared to the equitable remedy of enjoining respondent from continuing to interfere in the first place. The balance of equities favor petitioner. The equities balance in favor of granting petitioner the requested relief, allowing petitioner to act access her financial assets will allow petitioner to properly manage all ongoing personal and business financial obligations Absent an injunction, petitioner's financial well-being is subject to imminent and irreparable harm by respondent's action. Respondent, however, would suffer no legal cognizable harm in being prevented from interfering with petitioner's ability to access her finances. In fact, respondent's only real opposition to petitioner having access to her funds is that petitioner will cease business with them by closing out her accounts, which petitioner has every right to do so. Under these circumstances where there is no evidence that injunctive relief would impose a hardship upon respondent and where the equities overwhelmingly favor petitioner, a preliminary injunctive relief is necessary and appropriate. Accordingly, this court should grant petitioner's application preliminary in joining and restraining respondent and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing all of petitioner's accounts, including but not limited to personal business deferred compensation and investment accounts and interfering with her right to access her financial financial assets and statements pending a final binding decision by an arbitrator and for such other relief this court deems just and proper. Wherefore, by reason of the foregoing, petitioner Wendy Hunter hereby respectfully requests that this court enter an order enjoining and restraining respondent and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondent's behalf from freezing all of petitioner's accounts, including but not limited to personal business deferred compensation and investment accounts and interfering with her right to access financial assets and statements pending a final binding decision by an arbitrator enjoining respondents and any of their agents, members, officers, employees, representatives, and anyone else acting on respondents' behalf from freezing, withholding, or otherwise altering any and all assets that are currently identifiable as accounts and policies which contain funds that were removed and or withheld from petitioners' own personal and business accounts and all other funds, whether known or unknown at this time, deposited into banks and deferred compensation accounts, resulting in petitioners' inability to access her financial assets and property. Preventing respondent and or their agents including advisors administrators and fund managers from removing transferring surrendering selling cashing in hypothecating or otherwise altering or moving any and all assets held in petitioner's name or on her behalf or in the name of third parties all bank accounts credit accounts, deferred compensation plans, life insurance policies, annuities, and other financial, personal, and business assets. Enjoining and prohibiting respondent and or their agents from acting in any capacity which might affect the assets and or operation of petitioner and or any other asset to which respondent might have access and where such access had already and might continue to interfere with the operation of petitioner's personal and business endeavors and or financial obligations. Directing that the respondent reopen any any frozen accounts or assets that grant access to any accompanying statements currently identifiable as accounts and or policies which contain funds that were removed and or withheld from petitioner's account within 48 hours
regardless of the date of the order. In joining or prohibiting respondent and or their agents from acting in any capacity which might affect petitioner's ability to close and or liquidate any financial assets with Wells Fargo, including but not limited to bank accounts, deferred compensation accounts, and life insurance policies, and granting such other and further relief as the court deems just and proper. Wells Fargo, I hope that Wendy Williams Hunter sues the break off y'all asses. I hope that Wendy is able to call it Wendy Williams Hunter and Associates, child, by the time she's done with y'all. What in the heck make you think y'all could just take that lady's money and freeze it because you heard she had dementia or because you heard she was unable to take care of herself? When she has actual people coming in there to come and get the money, y'all won't even let them touch it. Y'all think somebody trying to who do her? Child? Y'all let me know what y'all think about this. I'm tired from reading these court documents to y'all, but I know a lot of people ask for them. So if you want to hear it, go leave a comment. Tell me what you think about all of this craziness going on with Wendy Williams. Wendy, I don't know who has it out for you, girl, but you need to see somebody to see if you can get it up out for you. For real, for real. Leave a comment, y'all, and y'all know how we do. We'll talk about it down below. Talk to you guys later. Bye. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss out on any of this tea.